So let's uh, jump into the Gospel of John. And um, last week, or last John session in chapter 11, we talked about how um, Jesus had risen Lazarus from the dead. Um, and just for review, um, what, what do you remember happened uh, as a result of Lazarus raising from the dead? And as our kids are showing up, I invite you guys to take some seats with the adults. How many adults here would love to have the youth sitting with us today? Just me? No? Wow. Um, well, I'm going to ask you guys questions anyway, so if you want to answer them from afar, they're coming. Oh, good. I like that attitude. There's um, seats over here. Yeah. Steve noticed there's some seats over here. Um, and we'd like you to know that you are welcome to jump in with us. Um, anyway, what do you guys remember um, as a result of um, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead? What did that cause? Many people to believe. Okay, it caused many people to believe. Mm -hmm. Awesome, yeah. Because um, someone rising from the dead, that's pretty impressive, right? What else uh, did that cause? Many people went to the Pharisees, I think. Okay, people went to the Pharisees. Why? And um, they were just telling on Jesus. Telling on Jesus. Um, how is it that you can get in trouble for raising someone from the dead? Tell me about that. And I like you modeling inclusiveness by joining in with us. I want to affirm you in that. Um, well, how do you get? In, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so Jesus was now a threat to the Jewish leadership, in and how is that? Because many, like what he said, many people are believing, him. and then just maybe they're scared to lose their people. Okay, so the Jewish leadership do not want people to turn to Jesus because now they're losing um, control over. Um, over Israel? Yeah, that's um, that sounds pretty close to what's going on, huh? He delayed his coming. What's that? He delayed his arrival to to the uh, so Mark was it Martha that got mad at Jesus because he delayed it? Was Lazarus' sister got mad at him because he delayed his? Okay, good. His yeah, arrival. you're remembering some other details of Jesus took his time showing up before he rose. Uh, um, Lazarus from the dead, so that by the time uh, Lazarus came out of his grave, uh, um, he was already four days dead, which makes it um, that much more impressive a miracle. Because how do you resuscitate someone who's four days in the grave? Um, even in our modern age where um, we bring people back from the dead, if we catch them um, quick enough, we can do that, but not when someone's four days in the grave. Then things start to rot, don't they? All right, well, um, um, the, the event of raising Lazarus from the dead creates um, a lot of uh, tension because it's hard to hide um, a resurrection miracle from everyone. News starts to get out, right? Um, so... That accelerates the tension between Jesus and his enemies, um, which brings us to the hour that um, has come. That's the theme of our talk today. The hour has come, and we are going to jump into the text. We're going to use the ESV today just to um, get practice with different translations and because I like some of its word choices in this chapter. And you're welcome to just uh, listen as I read. Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they can arrest him. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. 
So notice Lazarus doesn't go away. He's in the picture. Um, Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death Lazarus to death as well. Um, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, my Father will honor him. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowds that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of light. 
When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. For again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of them. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees him, I'm sorry, and whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has com has himself com but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. So, what was going on in this chapter? Let's start by nailing what was going on in this chapter. Oh, let's hear from Hector. Okay, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Okay, good, that was chapter 11. And then what about this chapter? What's going on? What's going on in this chapter? Uh, uh, one at a time. Someone speak. <laughs> They're having a dinner in the beginning. Okay, so it starts with a dinner. Yeah. Lazarus was there. Lazarus was there. Judas was there. Was there. Judas was there. And Mary was anointing Jesus' feet. And Mary was anointing Jesus' feet was anointing Jesus' feet with, the oil. with oil, oil, with expensive oil. And then Jesus said, why don't you sell the oil and give it to the poor? Okay, and Judas uh, says, why did you just do that? You could have uh, sold, that. sold that and given stuff to the poor. Mm -hmm. Sounds good, he's right? A, he's a thief, though. Oh, but he's a thief. Yeah. Good, you remember a lot. <laughs> so he wasn't genuine. He wasn't serious about that intention. Because he just wanted access to money. <laughs> um, good. So you got some good details you remember. Um, we got Lazarus in the picture that Hector mentioned. Um, Anne, did you have your hand up? He rode on a donkey. Oh, okay. He, uh, Jesus rode on a donkey. Okay. It's Everybody kind of started different. Him as king. Everyone started praising him as king. Okay, that's a big deal. John mentions some prophecies that was um, that was fulfilled here by what Jesus had done. Like okay. Zechariah and Isaiah. So Jesus riding on a donkey is the fulfillment of prophecy. Mm -hmm. Good. From Zechariah. You're right. But his own disciples didn't, didn't know it. At that time. Okay, good. Yeah, and the, his own disciples... Uh, yeah didn't realize that his actions were fulfilling scripture. Until when? Until he was glorified. Until he was glorified, good. Um, what else did you notice? He said that the ruler will be cast out, which is sin. Okay, so now is the time for the ruler of this world, or prince of this world, to be cast out, and your theory on that is that's a reference to Satan. 
And I think that could be a good theory. Um, good. You guys really uh, caught a lot. Anyone want to add to that? Are we good? Some Greeks. Oh, okay. Some Greeks who wanted to see Jesus. So there were some That's Greeks that wanted to see started. Jesus? Oh, and then a, a, a talk started. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, uh, who talked? Um, Jesus started saying all these things like, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Okay. Transition. Good. <laughs> and then, so then it transitions into Jesus teaching. Yeah, and making a claim that the hour has come. What do you got, Hector? About the what? Oh, yeah. What about a grain of wheat? Tell me about that. Yeah. So a grain of wheat needs to die before it can bear fruit. Yeah. If it if it dies, then it bears fruit. Good. Um, what do you think that's? Uh, Talking about. That's okay. That leaves a mystery. We don't need to know. Um, it's even better when we got unanswered questions. Um, so, before we move forward, anyone want to add to that? Because you guys did a really good job on remembering a lot of going ons. Um, two times in this uh, chapter, Groups of people worship Jesus in very extravagant ways that I don't remember from being happening earlier. Like the palm branches and the like washing his feet with expensive oil seem very extravagant. Um, and both of those things seem to kind of be coming to a head at the same time that he's saying like the hour for the Son of Man to be glorified is near. That's a it's a great observation. Uh, Eric just mentioned there's two expressions of worship. Um, in this chapter that looks um, a little more unique or intense in this chapter. One was in a private setting where um, Mary pours expensive oil on his feet, um, at which Jesus says, hey, you don't always have me with you. Um, now's the time to worship me in a um, very personal way. And she took advantage. I'm glad you brought that up. And the other was um, from the people as a community were... Uh, um, using palm branches to wave or signify, here's the king. Um, and we have not seen that up till this point. So he's getting embraced as the king. Um, and that's a great transition into um, where we're going. Thanks, Eric. Um, because um, at the heart of what's going on in this chapter is Jesus was being received by the crowd as the king of Israel. So, let's ask, was it actually Jesus' intention at this time to present himself as king of Israel? What do you guys think? Yes? No? Yes. Maybe. Yes? Okay, why do you say yes? Uh, because uh, uh, he was, uh, it was, it was like prophesied. It was like he mentioned, uh, the hour has come mm -hmm. to, uh, to to glorify or to glorify the Father. To, so he, it was an intention already because it was like a prophecy that it needed to happen. Good. So he, uh, Jesus now expresses that the hour is at hand. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So good. He sat on the donkey too. Awesome. He sat on a donkey. So you guys are right. Yes, he actually did intend at this time to present himself as king of Israel. He entered Jerusalem on a donkey, um, signifying the approach of the gentle king um, found in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. I, why, I know the answer, but why, why would a... Uh... A king is not usual to run on a donkey. I mean, donkeys are pretty humbly. Okay. To be, I mean, it's like the poorest of animals to be riding on. And they, he proclaims to be king, but now he's riding on a donkey. Yeah, why would a king come riding on a donkey? You said you know the answer, so what's your answer? Um, well, the, the, the Jewish people expected a king to be riding on a white horse, uh, as it was prophesied. But not mm -hmm. prophesied, I'm sorry. Uh, not riding on a donkey. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe Jesus was trying to impress in us uh, a different kind of attitude of what a, a king should be. Okay, and a different kind of, of uh, uh, attitude. Um, attitude yeah. about what we're expecting. Yeah, or or uh, well, I like to put it as a different side to a king. Because uh, well, let's take the white horse. It, when a king rides on a white horse, what do kings do that for? To show off. Okay, to show off, what else do they ride on white horses for? To represent power. Okay, authority. horses power, right? Mm -hmm. You ride on the horses for war. Um, with a donkey, um, and the verbiage of Zechariah, he came gentle on a donkey. We see a gentle king. Um, uh, if you do a historical background, some suggest that um, you would um, start war riding on a horse, and then when the war is over, um, you ride on a donkey as a sign of peace. Um, that sounds reasonable to me. Um, but ultimately, the text of Zechariah focuses on um, the king on his gentle side. Um, so he's a very approachable king um, in this setting. So good questions and observations. Um, and uh, he's on a donkey, but yet we know the prophecy, this is an expression of I am your king. And then people responded with what? Throwing branches. Throwing branches. Good. Which, as Eric mentioned, uh, this this is pretty unique. What do the branches represent? Um, Pastor Freddie, do you know what the branches represent? No, that's just a sign of uh, a way of uh, acknowledging Christ as King, as far as I recall. Uh, okay. Yeah. So if. Whether there's something palm branches represent or not, what we at least know is is a way of acknowledging um, the Christ as Pastor yeah, Freddie. As you, you you look into the text, they do, many of them believed in him, so that would be an acknowledgement of who he was. Um, so yeah, so uh, there's lots of expressions. Of it's people's, an expression. yes, an expression of belief. Mm -hmm. Great it's question. Like a tradition that they do for kings. Yeah, I don't want to say yes or no because honestly, I don't know. Um, as you guys discover these answers, send them our way so we can learn even more. Good question. What was the primary reason, um, according to this chapter at least, that the Jewish crowd received Jesus as their king? So especially from this chapter, what was the primary reason the Jewish crowd received Jesus as their king? Because he was going to heal them. Because what? He was going to heal them. Oh, he was going to heal them? Yeah, uh, there was, I'm sorry, I don't have my book, but I think there was a passage where it says, uh, they'll like come to me and I'll heal them. Or... Oh, okay, I think you're thinking of the Isaiah passage uh, that's towards the it's end. In verse 18. Um, what's verse 18 say? The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. The oh, Lazarus so had been to him. Okay, good. What did you say, uh, Anne, to build on Sarah? The sign was the raising of Lazarus. The sign was the raising of Lazarus. Good. Um, so, <coughs> the primary reason focused on in this chapter is the raising of Lazarus. Um, there's a lot of attention to that point. Verses 9 through 11 and 17 through 19. Um, Jesus says that the hour has come. What is it the hour for? What's that? His death. You said glorification. Good. It was the hour um, for him to be glorified. Um, and then you said, uh, my Karen, it's the hour to die um, in order that, as we kind of mentioned earlier, um, in order to bear fruit. <laughs> and in this case, what would the fruit be if we look in verses 24 through 27? What do you think the fruit would be? What do you think the fruit would be in verses 24 through 27? Um, uh, a 
Okay, I heard something about servant. I heard something about believers. What's that? Salvation. salvation. Says, uh, What's the verbiage? Uh, if you go the salvation direction, what would be the the verbiage? Um, save. Does it say that in the? Maybe it does. Um, <coughs> what about in verse twenty-five? The one that gets eternal life? Um, yeah, eternal life is going to be the ultimate fruit um, of Jesus' death. It makes possible the eternal life that we ultimately get to enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, so, great answer. Someone said servant, and I see where you're getting that from, because uh, um, those who serve the Father will be honored. Mm -hmm. um, so, good, good observation. Um, okay, it's also the hour for the prince to be cast out. Um, someone pointed that out already. And you mentioned that, that um, we're most likely referring to Satan um, being cast out. So what do you think that's all about? Um, how, how was that the hour um, for Satan to be cast out? And if, that's, if in some way or another Satan was cast out, um, then uh, how does that make a difference? How are things different now, thanks to that, than they were before? Is that when uh, Adam and Eve sold the deed to Satan, and now Jesus, uh, as he's being, as he's going into the cross, he <coughs> is redeeming that deed that it was sold, that it was redeemed to Satan in the beginning? Okay, so you're saying Adam and Eve belonged to Satan in some? No, when Adam and Eve sinned, uh -huh. uh, they gave that deed to Satan. Is that right? And oh, okay. Jesus so Jesus has been taking that deed. So kind of like uh, um, when, when we look at Adam and Eve, uh, Satan has kind of triumphed. Yeah. But in the case of Christ, um, and this is the first time Satan doesn't triumph. Remember that passage where they said, I will bruise his heel? And I will okay, uh, yeah, I will bruise his... Uh, I forgot that passage. Um, yeah, I, I'll bruise his heel, but... Uh, he, he will bruise his heel, but he will crush his head, yeah. Yes. Um, so, um, yeah, that's a good uh, verse, and there's got to be something to that. Any other input? What was the question? Um, uh, what's different... Um, so Jesus is saying, now is the hour for um, the prince of this world to be cast out. So in some sense, at that point, Satan was cast out. Um, cast out where? Um, that's a good question. Isn't it like because he's going to be cast out in the... Because there's only like one. If one is glorified, one has to be cast out. Uh-huh. There cannot be two. Okay, so there cannot be two... Uh, Cast out um, to the lake of fire. That's a good question. So let's check out. Uh, um, so I mentioned in the slide Job 1 versus Revelation 12. I don't want to open up to Job 1. Um, I'll try to highlight what we see. When we go to Job 1, we see Satan able to approach uh, God um, and then stand before God and accuse uh, God's people namely Job. And God brags about Job and says, uh, have you considered my righteous servant Job? And then what does Satan say? He's, he, he worships you because you give everything to him. Yeah, you, uh, well Job basically worships you because uh, you um, you've I given everything to him. Take away what he has and he'll curse you to your face or something like that. <clears throat> yeah, good Sarah. Um, so, we, so Satan has the ability to uh, go before God and accuse. Um, and we see that, um, an instance of that in Job 1. Um, now I'm going to turn to Revelation chapter 12. Um, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little and then I'm going to draw attention to a particular point. Um, uh, so Revelation chapter 12, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, 
Um, a crown of, um, you know what? That's not where I'm going to start. I'm going to start at verse 7. Um, then a war broke out in heaven. Michael um, and the angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. Um, but he was not strong enough, and they <coughs> lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled down to the earth, and his angels with him. Um, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now has come the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accused them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Um, and they did not love their lives so much as to sh shrink from the death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. Um, now, here's what I want to draw attention to. I'm not going to uh, try to place um, what time and place uh, in history Satan gets thrown down from heaven. Um, but the one key point that, no matter what eschatological view you fall in, the one point we can all, I feel, uh, agree upon um, is that we're able to triumph over Satan by the blood of the Lamb. Um, is uh, the key here because uh, um, once Jesus paid for sin <coughs> um, then the empowerment that Satan has to accuse us is gone because now sin is paid for so prior to, prior to the sin payment Satan had a basis for accusation um, but um, now, according to Jesus, the time has come for the prince of this earth to be cast out. Um, so, currently, my own eschatology, I personally lead towards, uh, I think I'm open to this Revelation 12 event um, of Satan being hurled down, taking place at the time of Jesus in some way. I don't have to stick to that. To me, the timing is not critical, and if there's difficulties with that timing, uh, i totally open to switching my view. The only reason I hold to that right now is just because he says the hour has come um, for the prince of this world to be cast out. So it's, it just works uh, very nicely for me. But regardless of where we stand on that, um, I believe that the primary benefit um, that happens at the cross is that um, the, accuse, the accuser no longer has power from uh, that hour forward. Um, so th that much I stand on, <laughs> for sure. Um, and who has a... Uh, um, did, did someone have any input or questions? Or? When was uh, Revelation written? Revelation was written by the same author, John, um, towards the end of John's life. Um, so, good question. Okay. All right. It's also the hour before he draws all men. And I give a few verses there because uh, I'm not just the verse where he says, after I rise, I'll draw all men. But I also give a verse that says, Greeks were already come to, coming, asking to see Jesus. Do you guys remember that detail? Mm -hmm. um, so he's already starting to draw men that are not Jews. Um, prior to that hour, his ministry was focused upon Israel, but now that's about to change. Um, it's also the hour when the light is among them just a little longer. Um, <clears throat> remember when he says uh, um, that it's only a short while before the darkness comes? Uh, um, Trust in the light while you have it with you before you're overtaken by darkness. I'm paraphrasing. Um, 
home and I, I write in the slide opportunity question mark because if you read that let me just reread um, that portion because Jesus says in light of um, this truth he urges them a certain way he says Um, in verse 35, um, Jesus told them, You are going to have the light just a little while longer. So walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of the light. Um, and if you uh, build upon um, and that, and the idea of becoming children of the light, we learned that in uh, Colossians, that through belief in Jesus, um, we are transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and the sun. So our citizenship is no longer of the earth, it's of heaven. Um, so we are associated with God's kingdom <coughs> upon belief and associated with the light. So there's an opportunity, um, as we're presented with Jesus' glory, to believe. As we're presented with the light, we have an opportunity to believe. And then that qualifies us for sonship. Going back to John chapter 1, those who believe have gained the right to become children of God. Why couldn't that hour have come at the very start of Jesus' ministry, do you think? You don't have to have time to reject him. Okay, they wouldn't have time to reject him. Okay, so I'm going to just jump right in and ride with that idea. Steve says if he came immediately, they wouldn't have a chance to reject him. So um, this is kind of what I draw from John's answer. It's not um, explicitly in the text. It's just what I kind of draw from the text of John. It seems like in John, Jesus wished, wished to show who he is first. Before he fulfills the hour, he wants people to know who he is. And he makes himself known through his signs um, so that we may believe. And I think because there's a lot of prophecy about him in the Old Testament, so he has to do it, you know, one by one. In a certain order. Good. Orders. He wants to show who he is in fulfillment of prophecy. I'm glad you mentioned that because we're going to look at that. Freddie, how much time? Uh, what's my pace? Uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay. <clears throat> um, I want to draw attention to uh, some of the signs and then some of his I am statements uh, upon <clears throat> doing these signs. Um, Jesus feeds 5,000 people with just a few loaves of bread in John chapter 6. Do you guys remember that feeding? Mm -hmm. So it's a supernatural miracle um, because with just a few loaves of bread he fed 5,000 people. And then he uses that sign. So it's not just a miracle, but it's a sign that points to something. And what does his ability f to feed point to? It points to the fact that Jesus is the bread of life. Now, um, if we were to look at uh, Exodus 16, we would find that um, God had already... Um, supernaturally fed Israel before in the time of Moses. But Jesus draws attention to the fact that those ancient Israelites ate that supernatural bread and yet they still died. The difference with Jesus and the bread he has to offer is that by eating his bread, um, we will live forever. Something not available through the bread of Moses in the wilderness. Um, when Jesus healed a man that was blind, that was another big sign that he did. And that's a huge sign because if a man's blind since birth, um, we've never heard of a healing prior to Jesus where a man's eyesight was uh, completely restored. So that was a big deal sign that um, suggested something about Jesus. Jesus gives the ability to see 
And from that, um, Jesus makes the claim, I am the light of the world. Now, I throw a few verses into the slide, such as Exodus uh, chapter 34, because um, we've already seen a man uh, who shined like a light, and that was Moses. Um, but in the case of Moses, um, his light was the result of coming into an encounter with God. Um, and then the light would go away. And during that time, he'd have to wear a veil. But then he wasn't veiled for the rest of his life. And it was just when he encountered God. Whereas Jesus um, is the light. He isn't the light for a little while, but he's the light of the world that while he's among us, now's our opportunity to um, I believe in the light, take advantage of it. Um, so Jesus is the light. Um, he gives us enlightenment. Um, we understand truth rather than stumble about in the darkness like we used to do before we became believers. Um, and why is Jesus a... How do we know Jesus can be trusted in this way to be our light? Well, because he was able to heal a blind man. Um, and this coming light is in fulfillment of prophecy um, where Isaiah 42 says... I'm going to send to you a great light, um, and uh, he will heal the sight of the blind. Um, he says a lot of things in that chapter that, will, um, that was miraculous, that the coming light would do, but included in that is to heal the eyesight of the blind, which had never before been done. Um, he also made the claim, I'm going to skip that one, because it's not really a sign. Um, another sign he did was the raising of Lazarus, which we had just talked about. Um, and uh, um, from that sign of raising a dead person, um, he then makes the claim, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, if we were to read 1 Kings chapter 17, <coughs> we would find that Jesus wasn't the first to raise a man from the dead. Because... Elijah had already done so. Uh, the difference uh, between Jesus and Elijah, um, actually the difference between Elijah, I'm sorry, the difference between Lazarus and the man Elijah healed, or the son Elijah healed, versus Jesus, who is the resurrection, is that those people, while they were risen from the dead, um, to our understanding, they ultimately had to go to their deaths again. Oh. Jesus, um, he is the firstborn. He is the first to um, be eternal. In him is eternal life. He is the resurrection and the life. Um, and it goes back to the bread of life. The bread he has to offer um, isn't bread like in the desert where you eat it and then you eventually die. His bread gives eternal life. So we have the hope of living forever. It's not just um, raised from the dead one time and then go back to the dead. It's we live forever. So he is a greater resurrection than even what um, Elijah provided. Other signs Jesus performs so that we may believe Jesus is from God include turning water into wine, healing from afar, <coughs> Healing a paralytic. Healing a paralytic. Um, so again, what was Jesus supposed to do before the hour would come? Um, John's suggested answer is that Jesus first wished to show who he is by his signs, so that we first have an opportunity to believe on him. <coughs> Trust in the light while it is still with you. Now, by the time the hour had finally come, why hadn't the crowd believed in him? Um, and first we got to admit that, or they had to admit that they couldn't deny his signs and miracles. Um, so those who were enemies of Jesus couldn't say, he didn't do those signs and miracles. The problem with that is 
the news was going out that he did these signs and miracles. He rose Lazarus from the dead, and Jesus' enemies admitted that. We can't deny these things, um, and uh, Jesus is going to eventually attract the whole world who's going to follow after him, and then that's going to be bad for us because the Romans are going to come and wipe us out. Um, so they, what they could not do was deny that Jesus performed signs and miracles. However, um, we do find that the crowds often question many of Jesus' claims and teachings. Um, for example, um, and the idea of a Messiah who would die was questionable to them because the Messiah reigns forever, um, is what you would get from Psalm 7 and Psalm uh, uh, 12. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I didn't, uh, there's some psalms, two psalms, and it's not those, that suggest this Messiah reigns forever. Um, apologize for not having the quotes. Um, but they questioned the idea of a Messiah who would die. Um, this idea that Jesus is one with God was a major source of tension. And that Jesus is a source of life was a big tension in chapter 6. Um, now, John ultimately explains um, their unbelief using Isaiah 6, where he suggests God has blinded the people. Um, and uh, I just wanted to ask the kids, uh, why would God purposely blind uh, people from believing. You guys have any ideas or talk about that in any of your sessions? That's okay. Um, that's a big question that comes to huh? Didn't we have an option? Okay, um, so Anne says we have an option um, whether we want to be blinded or not. Now, um, that may not be true because the quote um, in Isaiah 6 says uh, he blinded them lest they might turn to God and be healed. So it's at a point where God no longer wants them to repent and be healed. Um, but what I like about your answer is uh, um, maybe at some previous time um, they had a opportunity to believe and they didn't. And then God shuts off, the, uh, closes the window of opportunity. And from that point forward, um, God blinds lest they see. Um, so... By the way, John does not answer why, but I raised the question because whenever we observe a detail like this, it kind of, the question kind of forces itself out. It's hard not to ask. So, um, is that when they blind? Uh, they said you're talking in general, or are you talking about Jewish or the Gentiles? Um, the Jews. Oh, why does he blind the Jews? Yeah, why would he blind the Jews? Um, I think there is a passage about that where it says that he blinded the Jews so that the Gentiles might believe. And uh, the Jewish might be jealous about it. Okay, great. So if we develop Romans, uh, God accomplishes uh, um, his greater purposes um, uh, through the blinding of whoever he blinds. So when the, when the Jews were blinded as to Jesus, that allowed the Gentiles to come in. Um, so there's lots of reasons to that question, I believe, actually. Um, um, to close, I want to um, point out that um, in, in John's closing thoughts in chapter 12, and let's just put this in the, whole pers in the perspective of the whole first 12 chapters of John, Jesus is presenting himself as from God and believe on him. That's pretty much the message through the first 12 ch chapters. So now John's going to come to a close on that idea of if we have all this evidence through Jesus' signs and he dwelt among you 
and now you're going to reject Jesus, um, we, have, we close with a warning. And that warning Jesus gives is that to reject Jesus is actually to reject God himself, which invites judgment. Um, as, as far as Jesus goes, he did not come to judge, but to save. But, still, uh, we will be judged by the words spoken by Jesus. Because Jesus gives warnings, and we don't heed that then those words of warning will judge us. And um, why is that? Well, they're actually God's words. Jesus didn't come up with these words, and he makes that explicit. He simply um, makes available to us God's words. He, doesn't, he speaks nothing except what, that which he receives from the Father. So we're actually rejecting God um, by rejecting uh, God's messenger, Jesus. And ultimately, it's not going to be Jesus who will be our accuser, but rather Moses for not believing what Moses wrote. Um, and what did Moses write? He said, um, I, there will be a prophet like me that will come after me, and you must listen to him. So now in Jesus, we have the coming prophet who we must listen to. So that's the opportunity we have at the close of chapters 1 through 12 of John, is we have God's Son who was sent into our world um, and reveals who he is so that we might believe in him. And now we have a responsibility. We need to believe in God's Son. Because to believe in God's Son is to believe not his Son, but God himself. That's what Jesus said. So if we want to be believers in God, because lots of people say, I believe in God, right? Um, if we really want to be believers in God, then let's believe what he has to say through his one and only son, Jesus. And that's uh, what we've covered for the last year in John 1 through 12. And uh, um, in the coming perhaps month or two, we're going to narrow down on some key ideas, and then we're going to move into discipleship teaching um, from 13 through 17. Um, so we're coming to a close on a key part of John, and uh, um, your feedback and participation tells me that you guys know the Gospel of John really well up to this point. So that's credit to you, and um, good work on that, and let's close in prayer. God, thanks for uh, helping us to really learn your Gospel of John and the first 12 chapters and um, help us to now take that um, knowledge we have from your Gospel and to learn what to do with it. Um, help us to trust in your Son and help us to enjoy the benefits your Son has to offer us, whether it be life, whether it be light. Um, whether it be um, living uh, bread and living water. Um, help us to um, know what those things are and why those things are valuable to us and to be able to feed on your son um, and to um, grow through your son. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. amen.